week, the, the flaming redhead Gabriel Phillips preached on, get over it. He used the scripture of the lowering down and the, the 80-20 where, the, where normally it's 80% sitting and 20 lowering down, but four lifting one down. And he, he spoke us and he challenged us to get over it. Get over the crowds. Get out over the ceilings and ripping open the roof and get through the critics to get the broken to Jesus and be a people, that's why it's on the wall, who reach far. We're not reaching far just because we want to reach far with the name life changes, not at all. We're reaching far, those who are far from God, to bring them close to Him so that He can encounter them with His grace and His life and His love. But I want to jump in today, and as Gabe preached last week, get over it. I want to preach, get in it, get on it. I've got to make sure what you get into it. <laughs> I actually announced my preach in the first service, didn't quite get to my preach. Um, but, but get into it. Um, this is... Been, if you've been around church a while, you'll know I've had fits and spurts of, what would we call them, encounters with fitness. Year of the athlete statements, where I've made decisions to become healthy, fit, and strong. And uh, I recently had the incredible privilege of going um, uh, on holiday, and part of that holiday, my boys were wakeboarding, and they were just saying, Dad, you can't do this, you're too old. I'm like, what are you talking about? They literally didn't believe. So I had to take a moment. There was a moment. And on my first ride, my boy's video cameraing it. And they're going, wow, wow. Until I did two forward front flips. And you can't actually, I could show you the video, but you'll hear my son in the background use a naughty word. Oh, and as he, he honestly thought I was dead. They thought I died. My wife said they were so concerned. They're like, mom, get me, like, we're going back to him. He's died. Because they honestly think I'm that fragile. So I've made a decision to get healthy, fit, and strong again. And part of that decision was to get back to the gym. Now, one of the things you'll know about the gym is I, I signed a contract back in the day of the glory days where I got this unbelievable deal, and they basically can't fire me from the gym. But to keep that deal, I have to attend a certain number of days a year. And so I've kept that gym. And if you looked at my gym attendance, you would think, or maybe just a bit more, you know? Like maybe if I got one or two of the big guys, Grant Morkel or one of the guys up on stage, just say, he looks like he goes to gym. He doesn't look like he went that many times. That's probably because I did go, I just didn't train in 2023. <laughs> but I love people, so I would swipe the card, walk in, generally see people, <laughs> maybe go to the bathroom. And never really venture up the stairs. In my gym, it's up the stairs. That's, it's like it's like going on a wild game drive where you are the live bait. It's that kind of thing. It's, it's, so I didn't venture up the stairs for the whole year of 2023. But this year, I thought I have to change that. I feel like I'm crooking the system a bit because it's not meant to just be a relational moment. There should be some, my boys should think I can handle a fall. Not that fragile. And so I ventured up these last two weeks up the stairs. The first day, I thought, now I'm not going to, the, you know that section of guys are throwing weights around, ah, grunting, and you know, those young oaks weren't even born when we were raising flags, man. And, and so I went on that thing, that thing, and I'm just doing that thing. And then I thought, what I'm going to do, I'm going to venture into a spinning class. It was like the great migration, and I was just a wildebeest. There's a woman next to me who was pregnant, and she's killing me. I'm trying to, I'm trying to cycle, but she's killing me. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Uh, and then on this week, I'm struggling to actually raise my hands because I actually went into the weight section and tried, to, but I, you know, I just try to make it as if I'm just warming up. <laughs> these little, little dudes taking out these big weights and grunting, ah, ah, I'm just, ah. <laughs> just going to take it slow. I've been told, take it slow. You're not as young as you used to be. But, but I've just got to say to myself, get into it. You can do this. I want to, I'm a dad of three boys. I want to be fit for a long time so we can enjoy activities together without them thinking I'm dying. Because um, I, I don't think I am. But as I navigate this, there's this journey that demands consistency and a, a pursuance of growth. The challenge in the church sometimes is we presented a gospel, and I don't know where we came up with it, but we, we get stuck at salvation, and too many things, tick, done, that's me. My job now is to attend church. My job now is to be a part of a story. My job now is to make a statement, I'm a believer, but Jesus didn't call us to that. He called us not to make converts, to make disciples. It's the challenge of the gospel. He said, therefore, go, reach far, and make disciples. Raise them up to become followers of Jesus, His works, His ways, His life, 
to be reflective of His glory in this world. That is the mandate on each and every one of us. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Oh, I don't know about those ones or that one or my preferences. My, no, all nations. Baptizing them. That's why baptism is important because Jesus said this. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he continues, this and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. Oh, we're not sure we like that thing. And, and, and Mark, you preached that, that unequally yoke scripture a few weeks ago. I didn't like that. So that stirred a couple feathers. And I'm not sure I liked it. No, teach them to obey everything you've commanded. He says, and surely I will be with you always to the very ends of the earth. That's called the Great Commission. That's our vision. That's what we're called to. And we just simplify. We call it reach far, raise up, and release wide. Into the earth, as we send people out or send them into the marketplace or send them into any sphere of life, education, legal, whatever, we send them and we release them because they are mighty warriors for the king. See, there's a lot more to knowing Jesus than just being able to point to him. Uh, there's, there's, my, there, there's my savior. There's a lot more. It's, it's, it's an invitation to walking with Jesus. And Paul worked so hard. This was his cry in Colossians 1. Verse 28 says, this is the Apostle Paul. He's written many of the books in the New Testament. He pioneered the planting and the raising of churches. And he says, he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. There's a journey here, and the journey is one of maturity. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. It says, I strenuously contend. My first preacher I grew up on, his name was Chris Vinant. He had this kind of vein that used to pop when he preached. It just, it appeared then. It was scary. And he would preach with such passion, this vein would pop out. But he, I remember him teaching. He says, actually, when we're little and we're born, I've just met some people have just had a little baby. It's little. It's fragile. Everyone's got to look after the baby. And, and the baby needs nappies changed, and the baby needs to be fed, and the baby needs to be looked after, and no one has a problem with that, because that's the design. But there is a challenge. Close your eyes and imagine a 45-year-old baby having their nappy changed and being fed because they just didn't learn to feed themselves. And so he, he presented that the Christian journey and the journey of maturity is one of learning to sustain yourself. Learning to become strong in Christ. We're a new believer and we need the cry of the newborn. And the newborn might be 50 years old, but just encounter the grace of God. No, there's got to be a cry there. But then there's a growth journey to I can sustain myself in God, in His truth. And I can go to a place where I can actually take others and sustain them. It's the necessary journey that is so essential. And its Bible just uses this language, calls it Maturity. And so for us, reach far is so important. There's no mission unless we are reaching. I said it to the church this morning. I'll say it again. We're the only organization that doesn't exist for ourselves. We exist for those who aren't members yet. We exist so they can encounter the life and the love of Jesus Christ. Not a brand and not a preaching style or a worship style, but the love and the salvation of Jesus Christ. But then there's a mandate to raise them up. I'm the product of people who are prepared to get into my life and raise me up. Uh, sometimes people talk to me like, hey, we, did you, we, when you were born, did you just know the scriptures? No. No, I'm completely ADD. I love to get excited by the budgie that just flew past the window. That's me. For me to sit down and engage the Bible has been a journey, and I needed people to take me. People like Andrew Thompson in the southern suburbs, leading a church called Church of Maine, coming to our SCA student camp, bending the Bible in Philippians, and said, I'm going to preach to you the book of Philippians all weekend. And he did. And I was grade 10, and I remember every single one of those sermons, and I'm so grateful. But there's a necessary journey, and it looks like many things, and we think, well, obviously, the journey is a growth in understanding and knowledge, and it is. But for too many, that's the pinnacle, that's the idea, and yet it is a necessary part of the journey. And yet the writer of Hebrews challenges the church, the Hebrews church, a tiring church, a church that was tired. We aren't sure who wrote the book, but he writes this, in fact... Though by this time you ought to be teachers, he says you've done time. You, you were there, you were there, but you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. 
You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, still being an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. There's this application of the truth we are trained that teaches us to engage life and be able to discern between good and evil and live our lives. But too many are prepared to listen to a preacher talk so that we think they're important. So when the decisions come, I need the prophet or the preacher or the apostle or the man of God or the woman of God to speak into my life, to tell me which way forward. And I'm telling you, that's not my job and that's no preacher man's job. I'm telling you. And we live in a world, unfortunately, where people pay thousands of rands to go sit with a preacher or a pastor to hear the word of God for them. We've been given the word of God. You've been given access to his throne room. He tore the veil so that you could come in. And I'm telling you, we live too small a life if we settle there and we think someone else's responsibility to hear God for me. So it carries on and says, well, what is maturity look at? Yes, growth and knowledge, but it's also the fruits of the Spirit. I hope after 20 years of marriage, you could sit and ask my wife, hey, has he got better? I, I hope her answer would be yes. I pray and trust. But, but what about the fruits? It says this in Galatians. But the fruits of the Spirit is love, growing in love, growing in joy, growing in forbearance, growing in kindness, growing in goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. I've seen it happen in people's lives. A young man named Tony, who I watched drive to church, and in the, he had this little car with little spinning wheels, he, it, it, like, like on the outside of the wheels, not spinning wheels. I know wheels go around. And it was his bling machine. But he drove like an absolute maniac into church and nearly drove over people into church. That was the first time he came to church, and I chased him down, and I told him, you're not going to drive like that. This is my family, but... But he became one of my great friends. And now he's in Australia and he's worshiping God. And although he used to have ways that were childish and young, he's gone on a journey of worshiping God. It's not just a natural growth. It's doing time in the presence of God, in his word, and allowing God to come upon us. The fruits begin to flow. Spiritual discernment. Yes, we become able to discern spirits and understand good and evil and make godly decisions. Unity and stability. If you're constantly bringing division and chaos, I'm telling you, it's a sign of immaturity. But if you're able to fight for unity and you're able to fight for the kingdom of God, broader than a brand or any other smallness, it's a sign of maturity. Christ-likeness, the ultimate goal of maturity, to become more and more like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I said it this morning, I read some of the stories, I think, Jesus, I'm not sure I would have acted like that. I mean, I know it's hard to have an opinion about the king of kings. But he's sitting at a table, and then two of his disciples come, and they say, hey, Jesus, we just, we could, when we get there, could we be first? And I'm thinking, if I was Jesus, I'd say, shut up. How's Jesus? Get out of here. But Jesus, no, calm. Hey, let me tell you what it is to lead and to be first in the kingdom of God. I don't imagine Peter, like, I'm going to throw a knife at these guys. <laughs> perseverance and endurance. Mature believers endure trials with perseverance, endurance. There's, there's something of going through the seasons. It's oh, Psalm 84. It says, those who walk through the valley of Baca, they, they will walk and they will become, they will make fountains and springs in the desert. The valley of Baca is a valley of weeping. It's a place of mourning and weeping. And the Bible says if we plant ourselves in the house of the Lord and we worship God, we'll become sources of life even in our seasons of weeping. That's why a beautiful gentleman can get up in shiny black shoes, worship God even though there's a battle. His name's Ivor. Say hello to him. He's an amazing man. And what about love in action? 1 John 3 verse 8, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So this mandate, this call to raise up, is not just a preacher's job, it is the church's job. That's why we have life groups. That's why people meet in smaller groups. That's why we're doing marriage courses. And if your marriage needs investment, and just maybe, I promise you nothing says I love you, like let's invest in our marriage. It's generally one of the hardest things to get people to, because to go to a marriage course kind of says we need help. Well, we all need help. That's why the groups are super full and we've moved it to here to make sure we can facilitate it. Why? Because marriage is important and there's a big target on its back. And so we're going to keep fighting for those things. 
But it's got to be this radical response to Jesus. But it's this call, and this is the challenge. Matthew 4, he calls the disciples as he's calling you and I. He says, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. We know the statement. And yet there's this first, this invitation, come. The, the, the translators say the actual translation is more, come away. It's not just come on my mission. Come away with me. Come into my presence. Come close to me. Come. It says, come. Come. And then the, the great challenge of follow me. Now, follow me is not a statement that's going to get lots of hits online these days. You watch the alpha males on Instagram and it's Andrew Tate and all the boys. Be an alpha. Be a leader. Stand. Tell everyone they must follow you. You make all the decisions. You tell everyone is amazing. And that's the narrative being preached what masculinity looks like. And if Jesus says you want to be masculine, follow me. Jesus says you want to live a life of glory, follow me. You want to step into more? Follow me. You want to see signs and wonders? Follow me. You want to live a life bigger than you ever thought possible? Follow me. Follow me. He says, follow me. He says, and I will make you. I'm working really hard to sort myself out. No, no, stop, stop, stop. Come, follow. And God will make. God does the work. He says, he, says, he takes the burdens off. The yoke is easy. The burden is light. Why? Because we're coming to Jesus. And on that cross, he took every weight so that your journey and your journey to being more and more like Jesus and growing in maturity is completely finished in his work. And every power for it is in the blood of Jesus and it's perfection. He says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He'll take you on a journey where you become productive and life-giving to a life-dead world where people are running around thinking, all I can do next is buy a car, build a holiday, uh, uh, buy a holiday, um, invest in a house and live in such fear that it'll all fall apart one day. No, take people to Jesus. Take people to Jesus. To be a disciple is to be with Jesus. It's, it's to learn his teachings. To be a disciple is to become like Jesus. They, they, they would literally walk in the dust of Jesus for those three years. That same man, Andrew Thompson, who I told you about Philippians, he used to preach and, and he was a prayer. And I would go to prayer meetings. I didn't know what I was praying, but I would pray because I believed in God and I was growing and learning. And we'd pray in Durban. It was 35 degrees heat. We'd pray in the Technicon Hall. We sweated a lot. But I remember there were, Andrew Thompson, for some reason, started, he would bend his Bible like this and pray. And he would hit his Bible, but he would bend over like this and pray. Next minute, a couple of weeks later, if you looked around at that same prayer meeting, there's a whole bunch of guys bent over with their Bible open, praying like this. <laughs> so I don't know what was going on. I thought, this is weird. Until I went to Andrew, I said, why do you bend over and pray? He says, no, I've got a sore back at the moment. <laughs> it wasn't super spiritual, just real. But that's what discipleship is. You become like father, like son, which is such a negative term used in this world. And yet my journey is to become like my father and like my older brother, Jesus. Now that is a journey. It's a process. It might be called sanctification. It might be called many things, but ultimately it's the grace of God at work in our lives and my journey of becoming a disciple of Jesus. It never stops. It never gets easier. It's an ongoing journey that has a cost to it, but it also has a glorious glorious inheritance attached when we come to Jesus and we respond. And I just want to take us to two, two key guys as I encourage us to get on with it, to get into it. I keep getting it wrong. Get into it. I, I'm looking down this journey of Jim and all I can feel is pain. I haven't even started yet. And some of you look at your Christian journey the same way. You think I'm going to have to say no to that and I'm going to have to say no to that problem is too many say yes to the gym but no to everything else no let me say that again they say yes to the gym and yes to everything else like the burgers and the chips and some of the gym becomes the endorsement to eat everything i know because i do that I'm like i went to gym i can eat anything i want why am i getting bigger and yet we come to the gospel and god says there's going to be a cost it's going to be a journey, and there's a transformation that's necessary. And I want to just take us to two guys in the Bible. I don't have time to take us to all the Scriptures, but the first guy, we see him in Mark chapter 10. All we know about him, he, he gets an invitation to follow Jesus. He's a, he's a man of standing and wealth. He seems to have health and life ahead of him. He's called the rich young ruler. We don't know his name. We never see of him again. 
And it says this at the start of verse 17, Mark 10. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. He's pumped. Jesus. Jesus. He's, he's zealous. He says, good teacher asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? And Jesus goes on. Jesus says, actually, you want to inherit? You want the fullness? Come follow me. But here's what it's going to demand. Go and give away. One thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Here's the invitation, follow me. But for that man, there was such an idol, such a hold, such a, a spirit attached to that money and that wealth. He's going, I'm zealous for you, but I'm struggling to leave that on the table. Here's what I'm going to tell you, businessmen. The gospel is going to demand you leave some good deals on the table because behind those deals is not the kingdom of God. Behind those deals is chaos. Behind the deals is bad partnerships. Behind the deals are other things. And it's going to demand a trust in God that is greater than our trust in the deal that's standing in front of us. But God, you want to bless my family? He does. But in his timing, in his way, for his glory. And, and let me tell you some single people while you're amening and you're saying, you businessmen, let me help you. There's some great opportunities that are going to align themselves. Oh, she loves me. He loves me. Look at his eyes looking at me. But I'm telling you now, the other side of 25 years of pastoral care, the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked. And it says it for a reason. And as hard as that is to stand here, knowing that there are some people who are navigating that journey, my appeal to you as you make your decisions in life, make God the center and watch his grace flow. Every time. You've got to leave some deals on the table. Mark, that's hard. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. For me, there's been leaving and loss all the way along as I, I got saved when I was really young and I used to cry. I'd say, God, why didn't you just save me at 25 so I could have had one of those really cool, radical, wild testimonies and then I was the prodigal who came home. I know that sounds weird, but when you're a 14, 15-year-old at Jesus, at youth on a Friday night, all your mates are joling. Look, let's be honest, I wouldn't have gotten to clubs anyway. I was too small. But... I used to get those big Bronx shoes so I'd be taller. Didn't work either. But I'm, part of me is praying and part of me is going, but there's something in me that wants to be there. You've got to leave that on the table if you want to see the glory of God. And be prepared to. So this guy, Jesus says, actually, you want that? You, no problem. Just leave that. Let me tell you about another guy who's young, who's got opportunity, who's making money, who seems to be at the pinnacle of a story, who would have been wearing Gucci and all the drip that comes with it. I think I'm cool these days. You guys don't even know what drip is. It's fine. It's basically what Adam dresses in with an electric guitar. It's drip. But, but his name is Levi, and it becomes Matthew, the disciple. And we see him in Luke 5. It says, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting in a tax booth. These are not liked guys by Jesus' people, by the way. He would take money from the Jews. He would overtax them. He would live a lavish life off their backs. And, and all that drip and all that wealth would be stolen from God's people and he'd partner with the enemy. And Jesus just said to him, follow me. And Levi got up, left everything and followed him. Then Jesus goes to his house and has a banquet at his house. Two different men with very similar journeys and access to life, get the same invitation, follow me. One, we never hear of again. He just walked sheepishly into the dark until his money ran out or whatever. His life happened. Another, it just simply says this, he got up, got to get up. Got to be prepared to get up. He's, he's at his desk. He's making money. He's at his place where he's found his status, where he's found his life story. He's worked hard to get there. It just says he gets up. I imagine he's just prepared to walk away from it all. It says he left everything. Oh, Mark, that's a radical word, and I don't know if I could do that. No, there was a grace for that moment with him, but I'm telling you, part of the gospel is being prepared to leave some things. We're not talking about the what right now, but I'm telling you, God's going to call you to leave some things. To walk away from some privileges, some profiles, some moments. And followed him. He followed Jesus. He, he followed him. He, he, he followed in the dust. He left the wealth behind. He left the privilege behind. He would have walked behind Jesus. And people still sniggering at him. Isn't he the tax collector guy? What's Jesus doing with him? He's as bad as the other guys Jesus are hanging around. And Jesus says, no, but he's my disciple. I'm walking with him. Why? Because I'm raising him up to be a world changer, to be a, a gospel writer, 
to be a king for the kingdom. I'm raising him up and he's raising you up if you will allow him. But it's going to demand a radical stance and some radical decisions. And we've just done a series about the authority of the word of God. I'm telling you, the word of God brings life. If you'll trust it, trust it, bring life. I met a man a little while ago. His marriage was chaos. His wife had made, to unfortunately in this situation, she had made a number of atrocious decisions that many of us, if not all of us in the room of God, we understand. We understand why you need to leave. We understand. But I sat with him and I said, is there a heartbeat? God can do anything. Trust. And, and I've sat in that meeting many, many times. And sometimes it's ended well and many times it hasn't. But I got an email from him. As he was processing his options, he said this. It is through obedience to the word and the prompting of the Holy Spirit that I return to my wife. I could give countless reasons why not to, but just one to return to. Her. I cannot imitate Christ if I do not see her as Christ sees the church. I don't know what maturity looks like to you. I don't know what it looks like to you. Is it the person who's able to get to church early, leave late, maybe? Is it the person who can quote the thousand scriptures, maybe? I think that's what maturity looks like. I think when you're faced with an enemy and a giant and a Goliath that needs to be slayed, you're going to place your trust on the Word of God, even when maybe there's a thousand affirming voices say, run away. I need that kind of courage. I need that kind of life. You know the difference between the rich young ruler and Matthew is what they saw. Here's what Matthew saw. He saw the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. He saw the healing of the centurion's servant. He saw the healing of the paralytic. He saw the healing of the woman with the issue of blood. He saw it. He saw heaven touching earth. He, he saw the, the healing and the setting free of the demoniac. He saw the exorcism of the mute man. He saw the resurrection of Jairus' daughter. Jairus' daughter, stand. She, he got to see the dead come to life. What do you want to see? I want to see the dead come to life. I'm not saying my heart isn't drawn to other things. I just know only one thing matters into eternity. What matters into eternity? Your life's not as long as you think it is. I'm actually not really crossed today. I'm really excited. But you're looking at me very serious. Just everyone take an Inhale. You're all going to be okay. Just breathe out. Just inhale. Matthew saw control. He saw Jesus say to the storm, be still. It listened. He got to see the provision of the 5,000, the provision of the 4,000. That fish, that fed all of those guys? Come on! He got to see the restoration of sight. He got to see the withered hand healed. He got to see the Canaanite woman set free from demon possession. I want to see the things of heaven. I've tasted too much. I've seen God heal. Someone came up to me after church last week and said, have you seen God heal? I've seen God heal the deaf. I've seen it. I laid hands on a person who was deaf their whole life and their hearing came back and they didn't know what to do with the hearing afterwards and I didn't know what to do with the healing. We were both shocked. I've seen diabetes flee. I've seen God heal cancers, people from cancers, incurable. I've seen God fill wombs that had no life in them. Our God is a miracle working God, but it demands a journey of following Him. It demands being prepared to leave some things on the table. I'm not saying they're evil. They're just not His. And becoming like Him. It means some of our pride, we leave it so that we humble ourselves. It's some of the battles we leave and we say, God, I'm going to trust you and you alone. Because you are my rampart and my shield. And then we become a community who's not delegating the raising up of leaders. Oh, we need another pastor. The pastor better get busy. No, it's your job to raise up the next pastor. I'm telling you. It's your job. I look at the young man drumming this morning. I desperately love that young man. His name's Jerry Chua. He's no longer a young kid. He's a man of authority who sat in my house this week and he shared a story with me and he shared things with me that are hard. And my wife came to me after and said, sheep as Jerry has grown. You know why? Because of a community. Because of a community. A community. So I do it again, God. Do it again. And it demands two things. Number one, will you allow yourself to go on that journey of becoming a disciple of Jesus? It's one thing to say, I know Jesus. It's another thing to say, 
I know Jesus. I know him. See, to know Jesus from afar, when the winds and the storms come, they get in the way. But when you know him, you know he's immovable. He's seated on his throne. He's victorious. He's glorious. And he loves you. And then you allow yourself to go on a journey. And while you're on a journey becoming a disciple of Jesus, like I am, you get the privilege of partnering in the Great Commission. And some of you are discounting. You say, I don't know if I can lead because I've got this here. No, we share the grace we've received. And we release that. And then God continues to pour out and fashion and form more and more of His Son in our lives, in all of our lives. And He deals with the dwarfisms and He deals with the limps. He's had to deal with limps on my life. And He's done it in the most extravagant ways. And many of you know my story. 19 years old, my parents liquidated, everything gone, world taken, no study loans, can't do squats. God has blown my mind with his ability to provide. I cannot, I'm too useless. Someone phoned me when COVID started and, and we, it was a pastor and they were a bit freaked out because they said, well, we don't have church. And people, I said, but you're phoning the wrong guy. I'm too useless not to trust God. I'm too useless not to trust him. He's been so good and overwhelming in his ability to see what I don't even see. I'm useless for a life without faith. And I'm telling you, sir and ma'am, you were designed for great faith. Stop delegating it to someone else. Stop cheering someone else on. Start living as sons and daughters of the living God. And together, we'll be a family who reach far, raise up, and release wide. And you know what? We won't even do it without programs. It won't be systems. It'll just be the life of God in and through the lives of his sons and daughters. Why don't you stand with me this morning? Matthew 19, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. It's the privilege of sons and daughters. It's the word of God or it's not. It's my life or it's my identity that I place on the side. It's a thing that beats in my heart or it's something that I do on Sundays. And I want to rip out apathy this morning. I want to allow the Spirit of God to get inside. Some of you, God wants to set a blaze, but the enemy knows that, so he's brought situation and circumstance to throw blankets over that fire, and God wants to come and breathe fire again called becoming a disciple of Jesus. It's not complicated. It's just becoming a disciple of Jesus. Can we close our eyes just for a moment? If you're at home watching online, it's lovely to have you with us. Close your eyes just for a moment. Spirit of God, you are here. As I say always, God, not the passion of a preacher, but the truth of your word. I pray, God, we would hear your voice. Jesus, we would hear your voice this morning. Follow me. Follow me. I pray as that glorious song rang, rings out, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face And the things of the earth will grow strangely dim In the light of His glory and grace Jesus, we worship You. We just turn. Maybe saying, Mark, how do I start? Repent, it means turn. It means place your eyes on Jesus. It means take your eyes off yourself, your failings, your failures, your limitations, your smallnesses, the brokenness of your family lineage, and place your eyes on Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the victorious, all-glorious, mighty King who reigns above it all, whose eyes are upon you, and every time He looks at you, He shouts, Mine! Every time you think you're too far gone, every time you think, actually, I'm just going to get into heaven and that's enough. I want to tell you there's a God in heaven who shouts, mine. There's a God in heaven over, who, over every square inch of humanity shouts, mine. You are His. You are bought with a price, a glorious price, a victorious price, a brutal price. You were bought. 
he shouts, mine. It's time to live. Before we open our eyes, before we move on, if you haven't a, made a decision to follow Jesus, I'm not talking about attending church. I'm not talking about doing Sunday school as a kid. I'm not talking about identifying as a Christian. I'm talking about following Jesus. If you haven't made that decision, I want to stand with you this morning and celebrate with you that decision. He's saying, if I need to make that decision, will you raise your hands now as I was about before your glorious King that He would see you and we stand. Amazing. Raise your hand high. Raise it high. It's time to follow Jesus. Raise your hand. Come on. King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank you, God. Right now, what was dead comes to life. What was stained is clean. What was insecure and broken becomes secure as a son or daughter of the living God. What was visionless becomes filled with vision and power for the kingdom of God and the purposes of the king. Anoint your sons and daughters, set them free, bring them life, put songs in their soul and walk. Walk with Jesus. Become like Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and His grace. We worship you, Jesus. Can we just say that together as a whole congregation? We worship you, Jesus. We, we worship you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you died. Thank you, Spirit of God, that you came and you sealed the promised Holy Spirit so we can know you, that we can walk with you, that we can see you, that we can place our eyes upon you, that even though we make mistakes and we fall, you come and you lift up and your grace pours. Thank you that it is a fountain, a waterfall that cannot be stopped. Let your grace fall upon your people, I pray. Jesus, we worship you. Let's sing that one more time. And turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for in His wonderful face. 